Greetings, guys. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Gil Kirkpatrick. I'm the CTO at VDS Identity Solutions. We build identity infrastructure products of various sorts. Um, the talk today is going to be about um, OpenID Connect, some of the security problems with OpenID Connect, and some of the mitigations for it as well. So it'll be um, a little deep in places. Um, we'll be talking about specific headers that get passed back and forth between cooperating parties and all of that. Um, and feel free to ask me any questions as I go along. So when uh, we first started implementing our OpenID Connect component on our identity <coughs> platform, this is probably about four years ago, I started researching um, the, all of the material that was available at the time. And one of the things I learned was that there was quite a bit of turmoil in the uh, creation of OAuth 2. And this is a quote from uh, Aaron Hammer. And actually, if, if you get a chance, read his blog. He's a very, very smart guy. He was originally on the technical uh, working group to develop OAuth 2. And eventually, he threw up his hands and said, uh, the process is broken. The thing that we're producing is awful. It's insecure. It's complicated. Nobody will ever do it. And he just walked away. And when I read that, I was thinking, oh, what, you know, what are we getting ourselves into? Um, so four or five years on now, um, it's not that bad, but it's something to consider. Um, the first problem is that OAuth 2 is not exactly a protocol. It's more of a, a kind of a framework uh, upon which you can build other stuff uh, like OpenID Connect. Uh, if you look at anybody's OAuth 2 implementation, you'll find that all of them differ in some substantial way. Uh, they're not necessarily, and they're probably not going to interoperate. And there are two, two s fundamental security problems with OAuth 2 and things that are built on OAuth 2. First one is the notion of bearer tokens. Um, are people familiar with the idea of a bearer token? Raise your hand if you know what I'm talking about. Okay, great. So bearer tokens fundamentally are a, a bit of data that gets you access to something, uh, and no matter who it is that presents the token, can use it to get access, all right? So there's nothing that really guarantees that the party that's presenting you the token is the one that it was granted to to begin with. So in some sense, it's, it's basically something you can steal. It's like, uh, you know, like cash. You know, you can just, if you can get the cash, you can spend it. Um, Bearer tokens are nothing new. I mean, we, we have them in Kerberos uh, as an example. That's why you have the problem of tickets being stolen um, that can be reused in, in other environments. Um, the second problem with OAuth 2 is this notion of front channel communication. And uh, I've got a diagram that sort of explains it, but the, the notion is, is that there's actually sensitive information that gets passed from one cooperating party to the other through the browser, and that's called the front channel. The problem is, is that you can't trust the browser. You know, the, the browser isn't necessarily a browser. It could be any piece of code at all that's picking up URLs, picking up headers, doing whatever it wants with it, and then either pass, altering them or passing them along. It doesn't really matter. And that's fundamental in the notion of OAuth, OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect. And we have um, you know, SAML in, in SAML single sign-on environments same sort of arrangement. Um, but it's, it's, it's an issue that has to be mitigated. So the, the solution, as the solution is for all things, is to use uh, PKI, and, and that fixes it. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so let me just review how OpenID Connect, uh, the code flow, which is sort of the standard way to use OpenID Connect works. One of the biggest problems we've got with OpenID Connect and all the related things is, is terminology. Um, if you look at um, the terminology used in the TLS spec, the terminology used in OAuth, the terminology used in OpenID Connect, uh, and in the token binding drafts, which I, or RFCs, which I'll talk about, they use different words to describe the same thing. And it makes sense, you know, if you've got a working group who's just focused on one activity, it makes sense to have specific terminology. But when you start looking at applying all of these standards, um, the terminology gets confusing. So 
On the uh, end user side, we've got the browser, which is sometimes called a user agent or a UA or a client, depending on which RFCs you're, you're dealing with. Um, over here on the bottom, we've got the client, which is a web application. So in OpenID Connector OAuth, it's called a client. In SAML, it's called a relying party or an RP. Most people call it a web application. Or if we're talking about token binding, it's a token consumer. But it's the same thing. It's the web application that you're trying to get access to. Um, the box on the top is the OpenID provider or identity provider uh, or authorization server or token provider, depending on which RFCs you happen to be looking at. So I'll try to keep my terminology consistent, but I probably won't because I've been sort of shifting between all the different um, standards. Uh, but that's, that's that, what those terms mean. So is that news to anybody? Is, is, okay. But actually they are three, even though actually they are the main uh, one boss, but they are called as separate entity of uh, object. Yes. Yes, they, they all collaborate. They could be on the same box or in different boxes, doesn't really matter. Um, they're really conceptual names for, you know, processing entities, I guess is what you could call it, right? Okay, so the typical flow through this, this exercise, uh, user types in a URL into the browser. The browser requests a page from the client or the relying party. I'm going to tend to call it relying party or RP. Um, and it's unauthenticated, right? Because the guy hasn't authenticated yet. So the client says, oh, you're not authenticated. I'm going to redirect you, redirect the browser over to the uh, OP or IDP um, with an authorization or an authentication request. And there's bits in the URL that says, I want to authenticate. The browser redirects over to the IDP. The IDP says, oh, well, this is an interactive logon, so I'm going to give you a uh, a web page, um, user enters in his credentials, the credentials get posted back to the IDP, the IDP validates the credentials, and then redirects the browser again with a bunch of stuff in the URL uh, or in the, in the response, actually it's in the URL, that says that will direct the browser back to the application with evidence that the guy authenticated. And that loop from the IDP back through the uh, browser and then to the uh, relying party application. That's called the front channel. Okay, and that's where, because you can't trust the browser, that's where there's a security problem because any information about the authentication that comes back through the browser is, is available to anything. Then the browser, because it's been redirected uh, back to the relying party, presents an access code, and the access code is, you know, might be a short string or something like that. It's very short-lived. You know, usually it lasts for about 30 seconds or something like that. Browser redirects and goes back to the client and says, here's the access code. There's no useful information in it, but what the relying party can do is exchange that access code for an actual access token, which will grant access to things, and that's what it does. It takes that access token, goes back to the token endpoint, uh, to the token endpoint of the IDP and says, here's this access code, give me an access token back. And the access token actually has, is, is the thing that will grant access. Um, the relying party gets the uh, access token back, stuffs it in the header, sets up a session, and then from then on the user agent will pass that uh, cookie back with the authorization information in it and the client will look at the access token and determine whether that guy has access or not. So he's been authenticated. That's what a typical OpenID Connect authentication flow looks like. Does that make sense? Is this news to anybody? Are people, have people been working with OpenID Connect? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I just wanted to clear. Yeah.
Uh, yeah, that is uh, OAuth two is is really about delegating access. Yeah, and and the big difference between OpenID Connect and OAuth two, OpenID Connect uses OAuth two as its as its framework. The big difference is the um, access token, the way the access token and the identity token uh, are presented. I didn't mention the identity token here. I probably should have done that there. But that's the big difference between OpenID Connect and, and uh, OAuth is the identity token. So, I mean, just going back here, this is a kind of complicated and a bit of a mess, but that's how it works. And it actually works reasonably well. Um, so the first problem is that the, um, the authorization code that comes back from the IDP and goes through the browser is available to, you know, to anything that happens to be running on the browser or anything that's pretending it's a browser. And that can be exfiltrated and some malicious application can take that code and exchange it for an access token and an ID token and then impersonate that user after the authentication has occurred. So there's a, um, an extension to OpenID Connect called Pixie, so a proof key for code exchange that mitigates this problem. It's particularly bad in, in mobile environments, so mobile devices that are doing OpenID Connect. Um, it's quite simple to um, install an application on your phone that can intercept those um, authorization codes that come back from the IDP and then repurpose them to do whatever that particular application wants to do with it. Um, and in the best practices uh, draft that's being worked on right now, uh, the general rule of thumb is always use Pixie. So Microsoft supports Pixie. I think Google does now too. Um, and any OpenID uh, Open ID Connect identity provider that you use ought to, ought to support it and you should configure your applications to use it. So the way this works is it's the same flow, but now when the relying party decides to uh, redirect the browser to get authenticated, it includes a random code verifier, um, or it generates a random code verifier, it's just a random string, and then hashes it and passes it back to the browser with the redirect operation so that it goes to the open ID provider, the IDP, uh, with this hash. Now, you can't figure out what the, what the actual code verifier is because it's a hash, right? You can't take the hash and figure out what the, the original code verifier was. Um, so it's just the hash that goes back. The uh, IDP remembers that hash goes through the same exercise again with uh, login and uh, generating the authentication code. And when the browser submits that back to the client, the client looks at the hash, has its, it has its original um, uh, verifier code, compares the two, so it hashes the verifier code it has, makes sure they're the same. And if they're the same, then it knows that the browser that just gave it the code is the browser that it, it issued it to, to begin with, is the one that it authenticated with. And then gets the ID token and the access token and goes on its merry way. So that solves the problem of taking that um, authentication code, the access code, um, from the IDP through the browser back to the relying party application. That makes it so that it can't be stolen by some other process. Or I shouldn't say it can be stolen, it just can't be used. So the next, next thing I'm going to talk about, and this is really what the bulk of the presentation is about, is token binding. So have any of you heard of token binding before? Several of you have, okay. So token binding is a set of RFCs um, and, and standards docs out of the OpenID Foundation uh, that have just recently been uh, st standardized as RFCs. They've been draft for, for a couple of years now. And it's getting uh, token binding as, a, as an approach to securing uh, OAuth and OpenID Connect is getting a lot of support from vendors in the industry now. So it basically solves the problem of how do you ensure that the thing that you gave the token to, whatever it might be, an OAuth token or an OpenID Connect token, 
how are you sure that the thing that's presenting it is the thing that you actually issued that token to? And it turns out that's kind of a hard problem to, to work out. Uh, but it solves the problem of token theft and token replay. And that's, that's worth a lot. I mean, we've been dealing with this problem of stolen access tokens um, you know, forever. Uh, this actually solves the problem. So here are the basic concepts. First off, TLS has supported uh, this notion of token binding for a long time, since, I don't know, for six, five, six years, something like that. It basically has a hook in it that allows you to get some random bits out of, out of the TLS stack called the external keying material that is unique to the client and server session. Okay? And you can't change it and you can't do anything other than you know, play with it. Um, but it gives you a way of getting unique information that's cryptographically tied to that session, the session between the client and the server, the TLS session between the client and the server. The second interesting bit is that for every connection to a server, the TLS client, when it's doing token binding, will generate a new uh, public-private key pair. And it's going to use that key, the public key, to identify the session between the client and the server. Okay. Now, if you remember Pam's talk yesterday about FIDO, FIDO uses the exact same mechanism. It generates uh, an RSA key or an elliptical curve key, but a, 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 an asymmetrical key for each session that it keeps track of, or each server that it keeps track of. So what we've got now is a bunch of unique bits that are associated with the session and a unique key to identify that session. Then with each message, the application layer, so typically this is a browser, but it could be any kind of application, is going to include what's called a token binding message with that message. And then the server can look at that token binding message and verify that whatever sent that message is the thing that's on the other end of the TLS session. So it, whatever, it, it can securely identify that process and tie it to that session. And this is where the interesting stuff comes in for OAuth and OpenID Connect. So to give you an idea of how this works, when you start with your browser and you connect up to some random application server uh, using HTTPS, underneath the covers, the browser and the server are going to neg negotiate a TLS session. Okay, That's the same as it's always been. Part of the TLS session negotiation is a set of extensions to TLS. And there are a bunch of extensions to TLS. Uh, this one in particular, it's a token binding extension. Uh, the client will say, hey, I want to do token binding. I support this version. The server will say, cool, I support token binding. If they can agree on a version, and if they can agree on all the, the cryptography parameters, um, they'll set up a token binding session on, on TLS. and then. Um, the client will, invisibly to the, you know, the user, send an additional uh, parameter with each message on that TLS ch uh, channel, and that's the token binding message. And in HTTP, it's actually a header called sec token binding. So you don't have to do anything with that, right? The browser does it automatically. But if you happen to use Wireshark or whatever, and you look at the headers being passed from the browser to the server, you'll see this additional uh, header with a uh, URL encoded, you know, long URL encoded string. That's the actual token binding message. So give you an idea of what that looks like. Just what I said, it's, you see the sec token binding header there. It's a bunch of goo. Um, what that is, is, is a URL encoded structure that looks like this down here on the bottom. There's a token binding type, a token binding ID, which is just the public key that the client uh, created for that server, and then a signature that's calculated over the uh, EKM and the binding type and the uh, parameters of the key. 
So what does this get us? Well, this gets us the ability to tie application objects, so things that are being passed back and forth between the client and the server, to that TLS session. What's the advantage of that? The advantage is that someone can't steal one of those things and use it from some other machine in some other environment in some other session. So do you remember the, uh, the Facebook exploit from, I don't know, a month, six weeks ago? It was like, I don't know, 50 million uh, accounts were compromised by access token theft. Okay, I'll, t I'll get back to that later, but it gives you an idea of how important this kind of technology is, is to make sure that these access tokens don't get pulled out of a session by some malicious uh, JavaScript running on a browser and then used for some other, for some other purpose. So, only Chrome and Edge uh, right now, only Edge and Chrome support it. So it's, it's been in Edge for a while, uh, and it's Chrome version 71 that supports it. I'll, I'll get to that a little bit later on. So, yeah. If you go back to OAuth 1, it effectively was doing that only. Yes. took away OAuth 1 complexity, and we are putting it back on the different And it's, it's, um, your comment's correct. The, you know, the comment was in OAuth 1, we already did something like this, and uh, we got rid of it in OAuth 2, and now we're sort of putting it back, and it's adding more complexity. And that's exactly right. I mean, one of the goals of OAuth 2 was to simplify it because so many developers were having trouble implementing OAuth 1 properly in an inter interoperable way. Um, OAuth 2 was simplified, but now we're adding the complexity back to make it more secure. We look at SAML, which is I agree with you totally. Um, yeah. It can be used with any of those. So it can be used with any um, HTTP protocol. In fact, it can be used with any protocol that uses TLS. Um, what's been standardized recently is anything running over HTTP. So in particular, you can, you can um, your applications can secure, secure the cookies that it uses to maintain session information uh, with the browser. So it's always been possible to steal cookies from a browser server session and use them in some nefarious way. By tying those cookies to the TLS session, you can't do that anymore. Those cookies can only be used in the conversation between that client and that server. What's yeah. that TLS session? Just, hang on a second. So, so Chrome uh, yeah, announced that we're dropping this for, uh, I'll get to that in a minute, too. Yeah. So if you look at the mess that you just showed in the, in the slide before, yeah. Oh, the, the, what, the, the, this one? Yeah. yeah. So, the, 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 the whole uh, tokenizing stuff plus the signing is between the left client and the issuer above, but also afterwards uh, to the application. There's actually potentially three token bound sessions here. Um, one can be between the browser and the IDP, one's between the browser and the RP, the application. And potentially, but not always, they c there can be one between the client and the open ID provider as well. Um, that's, I think, in practice, not normally the case, but there could be one. So the token is signed uh, by, the, by the issuer because we can prove that the issuer was uh, the one issuing it, and then each for every session is transformed. Yes, and, and there's actually a little more detail to that, which I'll get into is when, uh, when I talk about how open ID connect. Uh, leverages it. Ends up being more complicated than you would think. Um, did you have a comment? No. Uh, okay. All right. Let me continue on then. So it's one of the things you can do with token binding right away easily is, is to lock up the tokens, uh, lock up the cookies that your application is providing back to the browser. And how would you do that? So the, the, usually the cookie will have some sort of structure and what you do is, um, go back here, is you add the token binding ID to that cookie and then sign it using the private key of the server. So when the token comes, when the cookie comes back, you can verify that it hasn't been altered because it was signed. And you can also uh, check uh, 
the token binding ID that's in the cookie and compare it to the session that it just came from, the TLS session that it came from. And if it's the same, then you know that was who you issued the cookie to. If they're different, then you should drop the connection and, and be done with it. And then you're saying the application has access to the TLS keys at that point? It's not directly to the keys, and that's, that's the interesting thing. You don't get access to the TLS keys. You get access to this, it's called EKM, so external keying material, which is um, a cryptographically derived blob that comes from the master TLS key for that session. And you can use the EKM to sign the computer? Yes, EKM. yeah. And this, does EKM come to the HTTP header? The EKM is something that is exported from the TLS session to the application layer. Um, in HTTP, it, oh, it, it never gets communicated, to answer your question. The EKM um, is calculated independently on both ends of the connection. Uh, and because they're sharing a master key, you get the same value. So how do I access the EKM through my HTTP Oh, you know, there's an API call, the TLS. Your, the, a, the TLS stack that you're using will have an API call to it use it. If it supports this, exactly right. Yeah, yeah. It actually, don't get the key. You just get the EKM. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yes. Yes. Exactly right. Yeah. So there are three. Um, looking at federation scenarios, we've got three parties that we have to worry about, right? We've got the client or the browser. We've got the relying party application, and we've got the uh, IDP or uh, Open ID provider. So there are potentially three, three TLS connections we have to deal with. One is between the browser and the application. The other one's between the browser and the IDP. And potentially, although in practice it doesn't normally get uh, token binding applied to it, is the application uh, between the application and the identity provider. So the question is, and this goes to your question, George, is how does the IDP create a token that is actually bound to the session that's owned that's between the, the browser and the application. Because that's where we want to bind the token to. We don't want to bind the token to the session between the client and the IDP. And this is where it gets a little squirrely. Um, so there's a new standard header. <laughs> oh, crap. Um, it, called include referred token binding ID. And I should probably back up and say in, in token binding for uh, HTTP, there are two kinds of token binding IDs. One's called the provided ID and the other one's called the referred ID. Okay, And in any given token binding message between a client and a server, there's always one, exactly one provided ID and there's zero or more referred IDs, okay? George, I can see it's, it, you know, the weight is, <laughs> it's, it, it's not, it's no, not, it's yeah, it gets more complicated. When, I, when, so putting my developer hat on, when I looked at this, I said, holy crap, what a kludge this is. This is, this is a disaster, but it actually does work. Um, so, when the client connects to the application server and establishes a token binding relationship on its TLS session, um, the relying party application will pass back a header called include referred token binding ID and set it to true. And the browser, because it supports this, knows that what that means is as I'm being redirected, because this only works on redirects, as I'm being re re redirected, presumably to the IDP, I'm going to take the token binding ID between me and the application, and I'm going to pass that along to the identity provider. Okay? So this is magic that happens in the browser. You don't have to worry about it. You just have to worry about the browser supporting it. So the browser will then redirect back to the IDP with two token binding IDs. The first one is the token binding ID for the browser to the IDP session. The second ID is the one that it just got from the application server. So this gives the application server a way to say, "Here's take my token binding ID and just pass it along to whoever you're being redirected to. So the IDP receives the two token binding IDs. It checks the, the, uh, the primary one, the uh, 
what did I call it, um, provided token ID with its current session to make sure it's talking to the party it thinks it's talking to. Um, and then it takes the referred token binding ID and it will actually stuff that in to the access token or the ID token that it ultimately ends up providing to the application. So to give you an idea of what that looks like, here's, here's a, a jot, uh, I, uh, and you can see this additional parameter, CNF. That's uh, for confirmation, and there are potentially multiple mechanisms for confirming the validity of a identity token. TBH stands for token binding hash, and that takes the token binding ID, which is a potentially fairly long URL string, uh, not URL string, but a base64 encoded, URL encoded string, um, and hashes it to a uh, much smaller string using, I think, SHA-256. And it uses that as a way of tying that, that ID token to the session between the client and the application. Okay, that's the, the trick. IDP that, right? The IDP did that, right. So this, this will maybe make it a little more clear. We got the same three parties, the same sessions going on. The browser does a get to the application server uh, and it's providing the token binding ID for its session, right? Because that's the only one it knows about. The application returns a redirect because it's unauthenticated. It wants the browser to go back to the IDP to authenticate. And it has the header include referred token binding ID set to true. So the browser, because it supports that, redirects back to the open ID provider and it's now changed the token binding ID to have two, two identifiers in it. The first one is the uh, token binding ID for the browser open ID provider session. The second one is the one that was associated with a session between the browser and the application server. And those are tied together in the same header. And the browser takes care of that. The browser takes care of that. The IDP takes that information, establishes a session using a cookie, and then redirects the, the user agent back. Now, it's, at this point, it's actually checked the validity of the session between the browser and itself to make sure that that's not being spoofed, and then taking, taking the, um, the referred token binding ID and sticking it in the, in the uh, access token, or actually, at this point, it's sticking it in the session associated with that user. Then the redirect comes back, it's got the session cookie, um, and it's got the token binding ID just with the user agent and the application. Yeah, the first one, exactly. Then the application server is gonna go back to the IDP because it has a code, it now wants to get an access token and an ID token. And it does that, and then what comes back is uh, an ID token with the token binding header for, does that work? No. With the TLS1 session in it. And then the relying party validates that. It checks the, uh, the TBH value in the token with the token binding ID of the session it has with the client. And if those are the same, awesome. If they're different, then it's a problem. Yes, yeah, exactly right. So what this, what this means is the relying party can now determine um, with certainty that the token that's been provided is actually, was actually issued to the session that it has with that browser. And it's not a token that was exfiltrated from, excuse me, from some other session. So let me stop for a second and see if there are any questions. Because this is, is it's it's actually kind of gory details. And the the reliance part of the, the violation has to be that it's probably using some TLS library, right? OpenSSL. Yes, that's right. So so the uh, I'll talk a little bit later about what you have to do to actually implement this this kind of stuff. But there are changes involved both at the IDP, if you know if you have your own IDP or um, I think Microsoft is now using using token binding for. Uh, refresh tokens for their cloud services. 
Um, Google, um, with some possible recent changes, but, but has been supporting token binding in their cloud properties as well. I don't think so. I'm going to guess uh, with almost certainty no, and I'd be surprised if they put that in there. If the server supports the, the browser does not, so obviously that means token binding is not correct. That's right. So, so when the browser, uh, so the good question here is what happens if you have a server that supports it but the browser doesn't? Um, when they set up the TLS session, they'll try to negotiate the extension. The browser, actually, the browser will never ask for that extension, so it'll never get tied to the, to the uh, TLS session. Okay. Okay, some uh, implementation issues. So platforms, .NET has supported this since 4.6, which is actually fairly recently. Uh, OpenJDK, a Java development kit, supports it. Um, using a third-party module, although I think it's been, it either has been or is being integrated into the, the regular distribution. Node.js, I wasn't able to determine for sure. Apache has a module for doing token binding, so you know that covers a lot of the surface area for application servers. Uh, Edge has been supporting uh, token binding for a while. Uh, Google Chrome does in version 71, but, and this goes to your point, there recently uh, there was an announcement that uh, Google was going to drop support for token binding in Chrome. And obviously that's caused a bit of an uproar because it's taken two years to get these standards done. And now Google's sort of pulling the rug out, of, out from under everybody. Um, and I talked to Pam about this yesterday and also last night, and she's not exactly sure where that's going to end up. But... The, there, there are a couple of possibilities. One is Microsoft continues to support token binding, but nobody else does, which means that if you're using Chrome on Microsoft properties, you don't get token binding. If you're using Edge, you do. That doesn't sound like a great solution. Um, if I had to guess, I would say that, uh, that the market is going to tend to twist Google's arm about this, and they're, it's either going, they're either going to implement token binding and support it in Chrome. Like I said, it is available in the beta 71, but it's not, not, uh, not going to be continued beyond that right now. Yeah, I'm, to I'm sorry? Um, I only got what Pam said, so I'm, I actually need to talk to some of the guys at Google and see what they say. I'm, I'm not convinced I have the whole, well, I know for sure I don't have the whole story. Yes. Yeah, it actually, this actually, the support has to be in the Chrome code where it interacts with the TLS stack. You didn't mention OpenSSL. It is in OpenSSL. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure which version, but it is, it is in OpenSSL. And Docker and Docker and Docker and Yes. Yeah. So, um, actually, I think it is. I, I, that's an omission on my part. I should have put IE there. As far as I know, IE supports it as well. So, do I need to worry about it like, uh, on the web app side? Do I need to worry about it, or it's just the middleware that's taking care of it? On the, ah, good question. So, the question is on the application side, do you actually have to worry about this, or does upgrading the libraries make this all work? Um, it depends on the form of the libraries that you're using uh, or the middleware that you're using. My guess is that you're going to generally have to modify the application um, to use token binding to take advantage of that. If the libraries are written in a really good way, that might all happen underneath the covers. But for instance, most applications will generate their own cookies. And if you want to tie cookies to a TLS session, then that's something that the application is going to have to do. Um, if you're using middleware to do authentication with OpenID Connect, and it's all sort of a black box as far as your application is concerned, then there's a good chance that that library will be modified that, in a way that all you have to do is upgrade the library and you don't have to make any changes. Um, that's entirely possible. If you use ADL for Microsoft? Say that again, please. Yes. Yeah. And, I, and so I, I talked to Stuart Kwan, who uh, 
used to be in charge of ADAL, but isn't anymore. Um, and he talked to the guys who were doing that, and they uh, weren't going to commit to a schedule it's yet. Microsoft. Yeah, um, but my guess is it will be supported because Microsoft is, has implemented across their servers and everything else. So. Microsoft Azure, <coughs> Open ID Connect provides that that supports token binding right now. It, it supports, uh, Azure AD supports token binding for refresh tokens. Only for refresh. Yeah, only but for. The ADL library does not implement Not as far as I know. No. It doesn't check for it, right? So it would be, you know, potentially the application could pull the information out of the token and then compare it to the TLS session. But. Yeah. It it will for refresh tokens. Yeah. And it's not it's not taking a job to write it now. Right. If you use ADL, it won't write it. Right. Right. Okay, so here here's another interesting problem, a real world problem for token binding. And that is um, reverse proxies. So a typical application deployment architecture today is you have an application server and then you've got some sort of reverse proxy in front of it. Um, and quite often the proxy terminates the TLS session. So the, uh, the TLS session is between the browser and the proxy, not between the browser and the application, uh, which means that the application can't use token binding directly. So there's another uh, draft um, RFC for uh, essentially recommendation for what do proxies do with token binding. And the gist of it is, is that the uh, reverse proxy will handle the token binding validation on its own and then provide the information, sort of the decoded information from that session to the application in two new headers. Yay, more headers. Um, <laughs> Uh, in SEC provided token binding ID and SEC referred token binding ID. So you remember there are two, potentially two token binding IDs associated with each application message. The reverse proxy will pull that information out and then set the header values and then send that message onto the application server. So Nginx supports it, Apache supports it. Um, what was the other one I was looking at? HA proxy, I believe. Uh, doesn't yet, but will. And just to give you an idea, so you'll see the browser, the session between the browser and the proxy will have the SEC token binding header with a bunch of stuff in it. And then the proxy will pull that, throw out the SEC token binding um, header and replace it with the provided token binding ID and the referred token binding ID. And one thing I don't know is how those are encrypted, or if they are. That's something I need to find out. I actually don't know the answer to that. Okay, so the gist of all of this, the wrap up, is bearer tokens are a risk. We've known that forever. There hasn't really been a good solution um, until now. Token binding basically makes sure that access tokens and ID tokens can be tied cryptographically to a TLS session between a client and a server and can't be used anywhere else. So it totally eliminates the risk of, um, of uh, say, malicious JavaScript or uh, uh, applications like uh, you know, um, you know, phone apps and things like that, intercepting tokens and then using that to um, impersonate a user to get access to stuff. The downside is it does require uh, changes in the browser and changes in your application at the very least to, to incorporate new libraries. And with Google dropping their support just like a few weeks ago, um, now it's, a, it's actually a bit of a question how, much, uh, how broad the adoption of this is going to be. Um, it might become a technology that's only available in the Microsoft ecosystem, which would be I think a tragedy, because this is a real problem that needs to be solved. Um, or it could be that Google will get back on board. So have they yeah. issued any statements as to why? I don't know. So I, like I said, I, the only story I got was from Pam, and, and 
and so that was her perspective on things. I mean, one of the things she mentioned is that um, Google is very concerned about network traffic, mm -hmm. just generally, because their business in some sense is tied to how much network traffic can they p pass through the network. And restarting TLS sessions with token binding requires an extra round trip, which I'm, I'm not quite sure I get that, but that's what she said. And I assume that that came up in some conversation with a Google engineer, that that was an issue for them, that this extra round trip was somehow a problem. Extra yeah, an extra headers, but I mean, that we're really not talking about much in the way of byte. So, That's all I heard from, from Pam was that it was somehow associated with the extra overhead of one more round trip reestablishing. It's not even establishing a TLS connection because there are no additional round trips for that. It's reestablishing a connection. So, so as an, one, one of the things you, you will have noticed is I'm always using the word TLS session, not TLS connection. Um, because a, a session represents the relationship between a client and a server with a set of keys and parameters and stuff. You can have multiple connections tied to that. So if you've got a phone or whatever, you're wandering around, that connection might go away and it'll come back, but it's still the same TLS session. Okay, so token binding still works, but there's um, the process for, for reestablishing that new connection is, at least what I understood Pam to say, requires an extra round trip. I'm not, I'm not quite sure how, how that's the case, but that's what she said. Right. Right. Why bother? Yeah. Well, Google's never been famous for for support of enterprise scenarios and 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 problems. Um, and this this is distinctly an an enterprise, or historically has been an enterprise problem. Right, I mean, we, you know, with with Kerberos, we've we've always been living with this this issue of of um, of tokens being stolen and, and replayed. Um, also, you know, individual users kind of don't care so much about security. Enterprises do. Um, so this is a real issue. Um, how it's going to play out, I actually don't know. Um, I'm really curious myself. I mean, we actually I started work on implementing this a while ago, and now I got to scratch my head and say, well, you know. Maybe I'll. Oh, I'm sorry. And we, so um, at VDS, we have an identity platform called Cobalt, um, which does Open ID Connect and OAuth and various other things. And um, you mentioned Pixie, but I couldn't find it in Google. What is Pixie? PKCE. No, you said something about Pixie to avoid. A oh yeah. So so basically, the 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 problem, Pixie. Uh, mitigates the problem of the authorization code coming back from the IDP through the browser and something intercepting it at the browser and then replaying it to get an access token. So, how was that solved with Pixie? I'm sorry, say that again? How did Pixie resolve that issue? Oh, it, it basically the um, relying party generates a random string, uh, which is, uh, I forget the term now. Um, a verifier, a code verifier, that it passes to uh, to the IDP with the authentication request. It's a, it actually it doesn't pass the verifier; it passes a hash of the verifier. Um, when that when the um, application goes to get the yeah, let me back up, when the application goes to get the code from the IDP, uh, res change the code to an access token, it provides the verifier itself. The IDP can hash that, check that the values are the so same. Store the session. I'm sorry? So if the IDP has to store that, yes. Verifier, the next yes. Time it comes back for validation. Yes. For that token, it knows that. Yeah. Same yeah. So basically, it knows that the thing that it issued the code for is the thing that's asking to exchange the code. Um, let me. Right. So you see, see step six here, the, the client sends the access code plus the verifier to the IDP. Um, the IDP hashes the verifier and compares it with the hash that it remembered 
Okay, so let me uh, head back to the end here. All right, so questions? I'm sorry, say that again. Is it uh, affected in any way if you use a portfolio TLS should you use a client certificate? No. Let me think about this. Um, I don't, but no, it shouldn't be affected. And the only thing I'm not sure about is the, how the EKM works, but I think the EKM is still available in the TLS stack, so I think that, that just works normally. There is actually an interesting interaction between token binding and FIDO. Um, how many people have looked at FIDO or sort of familiar with FIDO? Um, I'm, I'm like a huge FIDO fan. I, th I think FIDO is awesome and I, I can hardly wait for broad adoption. FIDO 2 um, actually builds in support for FIDO tokens in the browser and will, can make authentication both very secure and trivially easy for the user, you know, which is, you know, you can't get any better than that. Um, but the the key, remember, part of, the, part of this exercise is in token binding is that the TLS stack creates a public-private key pair to represent the session between the client and the application. FIDO does the same thing. And in fact, when OpenID Connect work, uh, works together with FIDO, it can use the keys that are actually stored on the FIDO device. So you, it can pull the public key off of the FIDO device and use that as the identifier between the client and the server. Um, and I think in practice what that means is, you know, you take your, your session is essentially identified on your token. You plug it into another machine, you get that session back again. I think that's what that means. I'm not entirely sure about that. Yep. Right. Okay, any questions? Any other questions? All right, thank you guys, you've been awesome.